Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for episode 4 of Mystery Week. Today we're going a bit further afield and I'm covering a case from Japan. Now I just want to start this by profusely apologising to any Japanese people or anybody who speaks Japanese or just, you know, people in general for my butchering of the Japanese language. I am like 90% sure I'm going to be pronouncing a lot of these words wrong. I mean no offence, I can barely pronounce English words a lot of the time, so Japanese is a stretch. But today we're talking about a case known as the Setegaya murders, the brutal butchering of an entire family near Tokyo in Japan. This happened on December 30th, 2000 in Setegaya, which is the second largest district in Tokyo. The victims were the Miyazawa family, who had moved to a large development in the district in the year 1990. So by the time they died, they'd been living there for 10 years. When they moved to the area, it was growing, it was developing, it was a really good area to raise a family. However, by 2000, this had completely changed. The development had gone quiet. The Miyazawas were one of only four households left in the area. There was a large skate park behind the Miyazawa house, which was about to go under massive extension. And so a lot of people in the area had moved out to make way for this. Like I said, the Miyazawas were one of only four left. But they were planning on moving themselves. They planned to move in just three months time in March, 2001. Talking about the skate park, it had actually been causing a lot of issues for the Miyazawa family, mostly just noise complaints. They had two young children, and there were always rowdy people in the skate park. The patriarch of the household, Mikio, had actually gone into the skate park the week before to have words with some of the people there and just tell them to keep it down and I think a big argument came from this. So the family consisted of 44-year-old Mikio who worked for an international consulting firm, 38-year-old Yusuko who was a teacher and their two children, 8-year-old Nina and 6-year-old Ray. Now the family's home was semi-detached and from the outside it looked like one massive house. However, there was sort of an internal wall which split it into two separate households. They could only access the other by an external door and they'd have to like walk around the entire house. The people in the other half of the house were actually Yasuko's mum and her sister and her brother-in-law. Now in the weeks leading up to the Miyazawa's death, there'd been a few strange things that had gone on. Obviously Mikio had had the argument with the skateboarder the week beforehand, but also around the community, some weird things started happening to the animals. They were being found tortured without tails, hanging from trees, just not nice things. Yasuko had also noticed some cars being parked in front of the house, even though there was ample parking elsewhere. And she just found it so strange that she actually mentioned it to a few other family members, seeing if they'd noticed something as well. So the day before the massacre on December 29th, a man in skater-esque clothes is seen at, oh god, I'm gonna have to really try and pronounce this, Sejoga Quenmei Station, I'm so sorry if I butchered that, um, which is fairly near to the Miyazawa home. That same day, the same man, or so we think, was seen buying a sashimi knife at a nearby market. So Saturday, December 30th was pretty much like any other day in the Miyazawa household. And I think for a little bit of context here, I need to tell you a bit about Japanese culture in terms of like the new year. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong. So many of the sources for this are in Japanese and clearly I do not speak Japanese. So it's just sort of like bad translations that have sort of been able to piece all this together. Um, but from what I can find out, Japanese New Year is actually a really big deal. Obviously it's a big deal all around the world, but whereas over here in the UK it's a chance to get drunk and have a kiss at midnight and have a dance, New Year's Day in Japan seems to be quite a big deal in terms of like it's a fresh slate and it's like you spend the day with family, you eat good food and that kind of deal. So Saturday December 30th was just the Miyazawa family getting ready for that day of celebration. In the early evening about 6pm they went shopping and they returned home about 7pm. 7pm Yasuko calls her mother next door and we're not 100% sure what their conversation was about but we can assume that it was Yasuko asking her mother if Nina could go round and watch some TV because shortly after that the child goes round. Nina goes round to watch TV about 9.30pm and returns home shortly after. From here we're not 100% sure what the movements of the family were but we know that somebody, most likely Mikio, was alive at 10.38pm because he accessed his password protected email and read a work email. Around 10pm a passerby later said that he'd heard an argument going on in the household. It wasn't like screaming but there was definitely some raised voices. Somebody also later reported that they'd seen a suspicious looking man hurrying down a path near the home. 
Yasuko's family next door would later say that they'd heard a bang from the Miyazawa household at around 11.30pm. They can't be 100% sure of exactly what time this was, but from the TV show that they were watching, they said it was most likely around 11.30 that they heard a large bang. That's all they heard. So this is where we're going to discuss the layout of the house, and I've actually struggled to kind of put this together because everything that sort of says the layout is in Japanese and so it's quite hard to like figure out which room is which. It was actually a three-story house. So on the bottom floor there was sort of a standard living area and Mikio's study. On the second floor was Ray and Nina's bedroom where they shared some bunk beds. I'm not entirely sure where Yasuko and Mikio's bedroom was. I couldn't really figure that out. I would assume that it was on the same floor as the kids but it may not have been. On the third floor was sort of a loft room that was accessed by a ladder. In this loft room was a futon and a TV. The day after, on the 31st of December, Yasuko's mother is trying to call the family but there's no answer. Actually, the line hasn't even been ringing at all. So she decides to pop round to just check on them. She takes her own key and as she walks into the house, she immediately sees something is wrong because Mikio is lying dead at the bottom of the stairs. I'm not 100% sure if she carried on walking into the house and found the rest of the bodies or if she just turned around and immediately called the police. But regardless, the police turn up very quickly. So this is what the police find when they walk in. Mikio is lying dead at the bottom of the stairs with stab wounds on the first floor. On the second floor, we have Yasuko and Nina who are lying dead at the bottom of the ladder and they have both been brutally, brutally attacked. Stab wounds everywhere. And in Ray's bedroom, they find Ray who was actually strangled and not stabbed. The second floor bathroom window was broken and the screen inside had been cut. So they immediately assume that this is how the killer got into the house. To get to this bathroom window, he would have had to have scaled a chain link fence outside the house broken the window and then managed to cut it and then somehow jump inside. And I doubt this would have been quiet. The general theory is that the person broke into this bathroom window and immediately went into Ray's room where they strangled Ray. Now Mikio is downstairs and probably heard some of this going on so goes upstairs to see what's happening. As the killer comes out of Ray's room, he sees Mikio in the hallway. Mikio puts up a fight but is eventually stabbed to death with a sashimi knife. Now this knife is actually broken in the process. Now we're not 100% sure what Yasuko and Nina were doing at this point. I'm assuming that they could hear all this going on and so were hiding but eventually I think the killer found them as well and tried to attack them with the broken knife but of course it was broken at this point so he just gives up and walks away. Now this is where things are a little bit strange because they later found a first aid kit covered in Nina's blood. What if he happened as Nina was injured so her and Yasuko were trying to maybe stem the blood flow with bandages. Now in hindsight it's easy to say why didn't they just call the police? Now it's very likely at this point the first phone lines had been cut but they could have at least called out for their family next door and I'm not sure why they didn't do that maybe they did and they just weren't hurt but they were definitely left alone long enough for Yasuko to go find the first aid kit and apply first aid to Nina. Perhaps they thought that the killer had just given up and left the house but in fact the killer had gone into the family's own kitchen and he was rifling through the drawers trying to find a suitable knife which he does find and then he returns to Yasuko and Nina and kills them with their own kitchen knife. And this was brutal, much more brutal than the other two killings. I don't know if the two girls were originally attacked up in the loft room and then were sort of forced down the ladder, but Nina's blood was found on the futon in the loft room. So whether they were attacked up there or they tried to hide by running up there and pulling up the ladder, which clearly didn't work, we're not too sure. Please speculate that the loud bang that Yusuko's family next door heard was probably the ladder being pulled back down by the killer or the bodies of Yusuko and Nina falling down the ladder. Now I don't think the killer was in any rush at this point. He was probably taking his time in the kitchen trying to find the perfect weapon here. It's very obvious as we talk about this investigation that the killer was in no rush to get out of there. So it probably gave Yasuko and Nina a lot of time to figure out what they were doing. The time of death of the entire family was approximately 11.30, which they could tell by the food in their stomachs. And the entire family was actually in pajamas, apart from Mikio, who was still in his work clothes. The killer was actually attacked and injured himself at some point in the night. And they could tell this by the fact there was the killer's blood all over the house as well. The killer had used the bandages from the first aid kit just as Nina had done to stem his own wounds. He'd also tried to use women's sanitary towels to do the same thing. And the weirdest thing is, he just sort of left them lying around the entire house. There was no effort to clean up anything. 
However, the creepiest part about this case is that the killer didn't leave after he'd murdered the entire family. He actually hung around until the next morning. He clearly had no worries about getting caught. He walked into the family's kitchen, opened the fridge, ate some melon, and also four or three ice cream cups. He found some ice cream wrappers in the bin in the kitchen and some more in the study where the killer had gone and sat down at the family's computer and accessed the internet. And he'd been going through the family's internet history and just clicking on random things. He even tried to buy theatre tickets and failed. He was on the computer for 4 minutes and 16 seconds. There's also evidence to show that he possibly used the computer the next morning as well at 10.05am and then it killed the power by just pulling out the power cable. The killer also used the toilet and didn't flush afterwards. Police later took the faecal matter and tested it and showed that the killer had recently eaten green beans with sesame dressing. Now, apparently, according to a lot of the articles I've read, this is quite a home-cooked delicacy in Japan. It's something that mothers would cook for their children, which leads people to believe that the killer actually still lived at home with his mother. But of course, that's just speculation. He may well have prepared it for himself or gone to a restaurant beforehand. He rummaged for information around the entire house, things like driver's licenses, credit cards, bills, anything with personal information on. And it looked like he'd sort of like organize all of this in the living room but there's also more stuff in the bathtub upstairs more important documents sanitary towels receipts all just put in the bathtub there was also evidence to suggest that the killer had slept on the sofa that night of course this meant that the killer left pretty much perfect fingerprints over the entire house like everywhere he wasn't scared about leaving fingerprints as well as his actual dna on the blood on the bandages very interestingly as well as there were shoe prints over the entire house and in japan it's just common courtesy to take off your shoes before you enter a home so it just shows how little respect this person had which we can probably guess already by the fact he's murdered the entire family but that's something that's so ingrained to Japanese culture, you don't wear your shoes in the house. So it's just like that extra level of disrespect. If at any point in this video I'm talking about Japanese culture and you're Japanese and thinking, no, that's not right, please feel free to like correct me down below. I'm just sort of going off what I've read on the internet. I've tried to like take the most reliable sources here and convey the information. But if I am saying things wrong, then please don't be scared to correct me. It's a lot harder to cover cases from cultures that are so different from your own because there's so many little nuances that aren't quite the same, which is why I tend to stick to Western cases from the UK and the US and Canada and Australia and that. And not only did the killer leave his DNA and fingerprints everywhere, he also left so many of his own clothes and own belongings. It's ridiculous. He left a jacket, a skater hat, gloves and shirt. And this shirt, there are only actually 130 of the, these shirts sold like worldwide. They only came from a very specific shop in Japan. I think I read that only 20 or 30 of them have actually been tracked to people and all these people are not suspects. There's also a scarf and the broken sashimi knife was left just lying on the floor alongside the other knife that the killer used from the Miyazawa's own kitchen. And there was a hit bag. Now this hit bag is something that's kind of thrown everyone off in this investigation, but I'll talk about that in a second. First of all, I just wanna mention the sort of killer's physical attributes. So from the clothes that have been left, they have judged him to be around five foot seven in his sort of 20s to 30s and quite slim. I think he had a 32.5 inch waist. Now this hit bag is very interesting and it kind of threw a spanner in the works with the investigation because in the hit bag was sand. And now sand is very specific. Sand can be traced back to where exactly in the world it came from very, very easily. You might think all oh, sand is the same, it's just sand. That's not the case. Now this sand very specifically came from an area in the USA, sort of California, Nevada area, near the Edwards Air Force Base, which is a military base. Now there's many reasons as to why the killer may have had this bag. There's a good chance that he bought it secondhand or borrowed it off a friend, but there's also a good chance that this hit bag was his own and therefore the sand in it would sort of have traced where he's been in the world. If this is the case, then the connection to the military is definitely possible, as well as somebody who's well-traveled. Now from around the house, they think that 150,000 yen was missing, but they can't be 100% sure. And this is about $1,250 or about 1,020-ish pounds. 
But there was other money in the house and this was all left alone. Other than this, there was just one jacket missing, a dark coloured jacket. Now they're not entirely sure what time the killer actually left. They can assume that it was before Yasuko's mother came round and found the family. They reckon it was probably around 10.30am. On the 31st of December, a man is at Tobinico Station, which is about 75 miles north. And he is being treated by station staff for a stab wound. And now the stab wound is so deep that it's reached his bone. Now this man hasn't said anything, doesn't say how he's got it, he doesn't even say his name, but he's acting a little bit suspicious. And the staff, once they found out about the murders in Setagea, came forward with this information. This would have been about six hours after the killer left the house, which is about right for 75 miles north. However, a taxi driver also came forward saying that about the time of the murder, about 11.30 p.m. that night, he picks up three men who get in his taxi and just don't say anything, they're just silent. But when they leave, they leave a blood stain on the seats, which the taxi driver obviously found disgusting and is something that would stick in his memory. I think this is a bit of a coincidence because I think there's too much evidence to show that the man sort of hung around the house afterwards and was there until about 10am the next morning. So I doubt he would have gotten a taxi with two other people afterwards. Of course, investigators ran full analysis on the fingerprints and on the blood. Now the fingerprints came back as nothing. They did not have any match at all. However, through the blood, they could tell that the mother was most likely of Southern European descent. However, the father was of Eastern Asian, so Chinese, Japanese, or Korean most likely. And this is something else which kind of threw another spanner in the works. Somebody of mixed heritage, European and Asian, would most likely be a lot more noticeable in a crowd than somebody who is just Japanese around Tokyo. And I find it a little bit strange. I'm not sure if the people who sort of spotted him at the station where he had the stab wound would have noted that he was of mixed heritage. Maybe he just looked very Japanese, even if he was half European. But you would think that'd be something that people would perhaps notice. Now the weirdest thing about this is the guy clearly didn't care about getting caught. And he's never re-offended. His DNA or fingerprints have never turned up in the system for another crime. And this is what makes this so, so strange. This is the kind of crime which somebody will do and do again and do again because it's something that is so innate and inbuilt in them, they have this need to kill. But this person just hasn't done that, or if they have, they've left no other DNA and they've never been caught. Whether people have sort of psychoanalyzed the killer and said that he was so comfortable being around the dead bodies in the house that surely he must have done it before. Also a lot of people say that he must have been military, maybe he was from a nearby airbase, that is why there was a connection to the airbase in Nevada. But what I've been able to gather from most places on the internet is the military probably would have had his fingerprints on file and so that would have flagged up a match. It seems like a really personal kill, but the Miyazawas had no enemies. They were a really like congenial family. They got on with everyone. They were just a standard family. They had no big secrets or anything to hide. One of the biggest theories in this is that it was somebody from the skater park who Mikio had argued with the week beforehand who broke into the house and murdered them all. It's definitely a possibility, but to me, it just seems so over the top. It just seems ridiculous to murder an entire family because you had an argument with the patriarch. But I suppose it depends what kind of person Mikio picked the argument with. But if this was the case and it was somebody from the skate park that Mikio had argued with, it was probably somebody who lived nearby. I can't imagine people traveling for hours and hours to get to the skate park just to spend a day there. It was probably somebody who lived in the area. And if that's the case, it's even more amazing that they've never been caught. A lot of people also suspect that it was a contract killing in this case. Somebody paid somebody to go and kill the Miyazawas, but this was too sloppy. I would be very, very shocked if this was a contract killing. The person made themselves comfortable in the home, left DNA everywhere. A contract killing most likely wouldn't be like that. I did a little bit of research on contract killings and in general, they tend to just be a swift gunshot to the head or something quick and relatively painless. So the person can go in do their job and then get back out again. And something which I feel like not many people on the internet consider is that it could have just been completely random. Maybe somebody had been watching them for a few days and just made them their targets, was like, I'm gonna kill this family. So they just went in and just killed them. Like, there's no reason, no rhyme to it, just they wanted to kill somebody. Although to be honest, if they just had that innate urge to kill people, I think they'd most likely have reoffended, and it seems like they haven't. The DNA in this case is obviously the main piece of evidence here. If they can trace that DNA, they can find the person. Personally, I wonder if they can do some kind of like DNA familial tracking on this, like they did with the Yara Gambarasio case that I covered from Italy a few months ago, in which they traced the DNA until they found a familial match and then went from there. 
I don't know if maybe Japanese laws are different when it comes to this, but I feel like I'd be so desperate to find out who did this to this poor family that that would be a step that I would take in this investigation. But again, as with a lot of cases I cover, a lot of this is just pure speculation. They have so much evidence in this case, so much DNA, so many fingerprints, so many things which should lead back to some kind of clue and they've got absolutely nothing. This case is still open. I think in 2015, they put even more officers on the case in a desperate attempt to try and solve it. And I really do hope that one day it is solved because it's just so tragic and this family deserve justice. As well as Yusuko's mum, can you imagine walking into your daughter's house and finding her and her entire family slaughtered? I couldn't even imagine. As always, I'd love to hear all your guys' thoughts on this case. Leave this video a thumbs up if you found it interesting. Subscribe to my channel and I'll be back to see you tomorrow. Bye guys.